welcome to director talks and thank you for giving your precious time from your busy schedule uh, for my show uh, so uh, i would like to begin with you are an animator a filmmaker uh, and now a visionary planner for entrepreneurs from around the world so how did your journey begin like can we know from the start uh, what was the fascination with animation since you have uh, been to walt disney and worked with walt disney and then hollywood we went on to working with fast and the furious all my favorite films fast and the furious <laughs> iron man and lot of the rings the bad movies too so <laughs> yeah, yeah so can we listen to all the stories like from the beginning okay well so it started my first recollection of seeing a movie and my mom has uh, has verified this was i think i was like 4 years old i think it was 1970 78 i believe and my mom took me to go see the jungle book disney's hand drawn jungle book yeah. and i just remember like i hadn't you know this was before the internet when kids were are so exposed to media and i just remember that um just looking up and seeing this completely imaginary world be created and being blown away by it and i just remember i asked my mom i said what the heck did i just see and she's like well that was a movie animated movie made by walt disney so at the right old age of 4 i just assumed that movies were made all by this guy named walt disney down in huh. this place called hollywood and it was only later that i realized whole teams of people make the movies and walt actually did he just kind of supervised from a high level he wasn't really uh, he wasn't directing or producing them or even animating them so that that first sort of um experience i had really made me realize that that people can make films or people tell stories and later in, and so that kind of put me on this trajectory of of uh, we got one of the first video cameras this is like back in like the early 80s and this thing was like a beast you had this big okay. camera and then you had another unit like that you had to like strap to you it was like yeah. really big and it's yeah. nothing like this right yeah so so i i at one point had all the neighborhood kids i i was fascinated with the movie et so i did my uh, my my 8 year old knock off of that so i had all the kids and we kind of i did special effects and and i just really liked being creative and telling stories with a camera And then when I was 16 I um when I was in high school I had really bad high school artwork uh but one of the things that happened was one time when we were visiting Disneyland I I um did some research and again this is before the internet when it was very hard to like get specialty items and I realized there was a there was an art store nearby Disneyland I I, I don't remember when I, when I was a kid it seemed like it was probably next door it's probably like up in LA right. and I was able to go and buy an animation disc and animation paper and cells and paint and so I did some some of my own art uh, animation cell work on, on and my mom uh, proud mom she, <laughs> awful artwork but she she put it on the wall and in long story short we had a wedding in our backyard and one of the guests at the wedding saw my really bad artwork and said do, do you want to be an animator and I was like I didn't really want to be an animator per se. I just want to be. I wanted to make movies and you know, kind of do what Walt Disney did. And and I was like, yeah, sure, why not? It's like the end of Ghostbusters when they ask, "Are you a god?" And, you know, you should have said yes. Yeah. So I've learned I always say yes when people ask you something. So yes, I'd love to be an animator. And she said, "Well, my brother, he works down at Disney Animation, and if you're ever down there, uh, just go have lunch." So I was like, "Mom, we're going." And so like literally next week, we we're uh, we we're down there. and my my 1 hour lunch turned out to be 3 days so it was literally like at the animation studio and this 16 year old kid i must have been 15 and i'm just sitting there with these guys that were making uh, these very talented men and women who were who were making aladdin at the time and i had like the keys of the kingdom i i was able to run around the lot and it was it was really awesome so it was is before security <laughs> the good old days and um yeah that really that really made me realize that it's totally achievable anyone that that has a dream of making films and working in hollywood if you if your skills get there it's entirely possible so my mentor the guy uh, alex who worked at disney i said how do i do this how, how do i work at disney animation and he said well you got to go to the school that walt disney founded called cal arts so i i um contacted cal arts and said hey i'm going to go there and they're like sure kid you know uh we've we've 
we're full for the year. We've already taken our submissions for next year. So don't bother. And I was like, no, you don't understand. I'm going to do this. And they're like, okay. So I, I, it was actually around Thanksgiving. We're recording this uh, like the day before Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving weekend, I, while my family was watching football and basketball on TV, and I'm not a sports guy. So I was in the back, just drawing, doing, doing uh, gesture drawings. And I, I cranked out as much as I could. And it was really awful. I just <laughs> put the caveat is really bad stuff. And then I turned that in. I, I, I sent my portfolio into Cal arts and like a week later, I got this little letter. And I'm like, Oh, you know, I had an opening yet. My mom's like, I'm sorry, honey, maybe next time. And they get, I, I, I believe back then, cause there's only about two or three animation schools. Now, like every school in the world mm-hmm. teaches animation, but back then it was Cal arts and Sheraton college in Canada. I think there was a college in Japan. And then there was um, RISD in Rhode Island. I think those were the four main ones. So it was really competitive getting into CalArts. And I, I opened the letter and said, like, dear Mr. Murph, I went, oh, no. and then it's like, congrats, you're coming in. I'm like, ah, right. So then I had a whole new problem because I had a year of high school left, right? Mm-hmm. So I actually had to like convince my dad to let me to drop out to high school so I could go to Hollywood and be a, a starving artist. And he was just like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> but my mom was a kindergarten teacher so she fully she's like let him do it let him do it and long story short I went to to this amazing school that that Walt Disney that was one of his last big projects before he passed away and it was an amazing experience a lot of the instructors were Disney people and then right at the end of my time there this must have been in 19 I want to say 80 1997 uh, they piled us all into the theater and they said, Hey, we want to show you a little, a brand new movie. That's that they just made a little thing called toy story. And we're all like trained to draw it, you know, by hand. And so we're all like, this is going to be, this is going to suck. Right. Computer animation. So the movie ends. And I just remember going, that's the future. And I turned to my friends, like you guys, we got to do computer animation. And they're like, you're crazy. That was a great movie. But that's a fluke. Computer animation is never going to take off. And I said, I'm telling you guys, that's the future. And they looked at me like I was like some conspiracy nut. Right. <laughs> so I, at that point, I had a, um, a job offer from Disney to do uh, cleanup uh, animation. And, and I, I turned it down. Cause I was like, I got to go and get trained in, in, in computer animation. So the only studio that would, would take me was a little studio called Rhythm and Hughes. Um, I don't think they're around anymore. They were a great little uh, little studio. Everybody had their dogs at the studios right by the beach. It was super chill. And they said, hey, Mike, we're, um, we're hiring. Uh, we're not hiring. We don't have any projects. We'll probably have to lay you off, but you're so talented. We love your short film. I did this little short film, which I'll, I'll get into in a second. And so they gave me a job and they, they uh, trained me for, for uh, two months on computer animation. And literally the last day of training, <laughs> they called me and like, we gotta, we gotta let you go. Cause we don't have any work. And I was like, that's cool. Right. Cause I, I um, was friends with all the recruiters and they knew in advance that I was going to be laid off. So I like moped back to the training room and they're like, Hey Mike, we have great news. We submitted your work to Pixar and Warner brothers and ILM and all the big studios and literally the next week, I was flown up and wined and dined. And I had job offers to work on Toy Story 2, Star Wars Episode 1, and The Iron Giant. And I, of course, I, I, uh, I picked Iron Giant because Brad Bird had come to CalArts every year. There was two people that uh, gave lectures at CalArts in the four years that I was actually I was there for three years. I went to another school. It's a different story for a different time. Um, but in those three years, there was two people that came that really, like, the, the, the presentations they gave were so profound. And one of them was a, was a gentleman, a great, very talented hand-drawn animator named James Baxter. And James talked for about 90 minutes and he broke down animation to such a technical degree that nobody had done before. And it really made me think technically and efficiently. And the guy's like a, probably one of the best animators that ever lived. But a lot of that is because he's so technically a, a proficient and he's really thinking about, you know, how many how many frames to do a step. And if the character's got to walk this far in two seconds and they have to be this big to take this many steps. And I was like, whoa, it blew my mind to think that way. And the other guy was was Brad Bird and he would come in and he would have story lectures. And, and that was by far my most favorite thing because nobody was really analyzing and breaking down films. So 
So when I had the opportunity to go work, even though like Star Wars was was um, George Lucas and 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 uh, Pixar, I'd be working with all the you know Steve Jobs and all the Pixar guys. But I chose Iron Giant because I really wanted Brad to mentor me, and, and I made the right choice because it was such an intimate crew, and. <clears throat> most of the crew were students because they didn't have a big budget. So they got senior animators or senior um, department heads. And then they would get junior level people <laughs> such as myself. And so, uh, and the good news was I, I was coming in at the, at a union pay level, which was really, really high. So my dad was the vice president of company and I was my first job. I was making more than him. So I was like, ah, starving artist, dad. He's like, okay, you're, you were right, son. <laughs> so there's some validation on that, but <coughs> I've got little kids and that little, little buggers get me sick. I'm getting over it. So long story short on iron giant, I, I was in this unique situation to be just hanging out with the filmmakers and, and like having daily meetings with Brad. And he was, you know, just, just a great human being, just teaching me so much stuff. And it was a, it was a really great first job that I had our first official movie job. It was like, I worked in the industry before that, that was like my first real movie job and then that that led to me having this really great animation and and uh, visual effects and directing career for and supervising i did i did a lot i wore a lot of hats but i did that for 15 years and um yeah so before we talk about other stuff any anything you want me to go and i kind of like i'm condensing 15 years into a sentence so is there anything you want to talk about a lot of people want to talk about lord of the rings and stuff Fast and furious. Yeah, I know. I would like to ask is uh, which is more difficult, uh, animation or filmmaking? Since you have made short films as well, they are award winning, and you have been mentoring about filmmaking and animation both uh, in your career, 15 years, you know, condensed career. So, which is more difficult, like uh, filmmaking or animation? What would be your advice? Uh, by far, animation is more difficult because everything you see on the screen has to be created. So you have to pre-plan everything, every edit, every movement, every prop, like, like every single thing has to be pre-designed and, and just planned out to the greatest detail. So there's, there's many filmmakers like Steven Spielberg's on record and, 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 and there's a whole lot more that have said the purest form of filmmaking is animation, which was really pioneered by Disney. Because again, you have to you have to plan everything. So unless you're a documentary filmmaker where you just show up and you just start filming stuff, if you're a narrative filmmaker, I can't think of any other film school that's better or at least medium that's better to learn filmmaking than animation. Because again, everything is crafted; it has to come out of your mind and be generated, and that's a massive undertaking. So if I'm doing a live action film and I'm designing a set per se, then I'm I, you know, I'm kind of limited by the realities of, of my budget and, and the space. And I have to go and get the, pro, you know, whatever props I can write. But animation, I can create anything I want. And, and there's, uh, there's, there, there's a problem with that, right? Because when you can do anything, then typically you do. And most, most animated films aren't very good, <laughs> I, must, I must admit. Well, most films in general aren't very good. You know, it's a very small amount that where everything works, the script works, the direction works, the acting works, you know. So it's it's a lot more, um, you know, an animated film takes about four years from start to finish to create. The production cycle is about a year or a year and a half where you've got like the massive crew and the 50 animators or, or whatnot. But to put four years into your life and then have it not really be awesome is kind of hard. So at least a live action film, it's usually like a year, year and a half of their special effects. So it's a little more condensed. But uh, yeah, I'd say that that there's a lot of the principles are the same between animation and live action. But animation requires so much more planning. It's like it's like running a marathon in, in wet cement. You know, you're just, you're going, but you're, you're working hard, but you're not really getting anywhere. Whereas live action, it's more immediate. You show up and you've got minutes or, you know, sometimes hours of film uh, created in a week where animation it takes, you know, to get a typical animator would do maybe about two to three seconds of animation in a week if they're really fast. So it's definitely a slow, <laughs> it's a slow it process. It's very slow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I would like to ask, which is your favorite animated character that you've created or your favorite animated movie, animation movie? 
so far. That, that I've worked on or, or yes. that I just did? You worked on or you created, yeah. Uh, I don't like anything I've done. <laughs> I just, when I watch what I've done, I just see like, if I could do it over, I would do it totally different. So I kind of like close the door on that. But of all the characters that I've worked on, I think the the one, the, the, the hands down, the one that really revolutionized the industry is Gollum. And Gollum. A big, yeah, a big part of that is because prior to that, there's a thing called rotoscoping. So back in the 30s and 40s, or really the, the uh, I should say the, the forties, Walt Disney discovered that he would go and, and film real actors in very bare sets uh, um, for his animated films. So like Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, because it really helped the animators to have a reference. It's very hard as an animator to, well, it's, it's not hard for one animator to create a really great performance, but when you have a team of people and everyone has different styles and sensibilities, it becomes this really fractured thing. So the best animated characters have a very uh, authorita authoritarian, I should say, uh, supervising the animator for that character. So a classic example, that would be Glenn Keane, who is one of the best animators in the world. And he's like most of the iconic Disney characters like Ariel or Beast or Tarzan, he did that. And when I say authoritarian, I don't mean it in a negative way, but it's like you have to have control. And if an animator is doing something that's not right for the character or their style's not right, you have to be like, and get them back on track. So if, if you've got, let's say you've got a, a, a character portrayed by Tom Cruise, and then you've got an animated version of that. Well, you've got one Tom Cruise controlling the entire character and the performance versus a team of maybe like 10 to 12 people with the supervisor trying to replicate that. So obviously the, the one person is going to make a cohesive performance and the other thing is going to be fractured. So getting back to Gollum, what they did, Peter Jackson's a very good director, and he recognized that if he had this animated character and it wasn't based off anything, you're going to have wildly different performances. And, and often animators will resort to more caricatured, you know, instead of like a normal thing of like, you know, we exaggerate stuff because that's what works uh, in, 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 in traditional animated films. But in a live action film, you can't have a digital character next to a real person. The real person has these subtleties and then the character is like, you know, and they kind of did that with Jar Jar Binks in, in, yeah. in uh, The Force Awaken or whatever that first Star Wars was, uh, Phantom Menace. And it really stands out as not, it's, you know, people don't like Jar Jar. And a lot of that was because it was just over, you know, it was, it was too animated. So what, what Peter did is he had, he hired uh, Andy Serkis, who's now a well, a well-known uh, uh, actor and, and director, but he hired Andy and he, he really made sure that Andy was the soul of that character. So as an animator, that was really the only time as an animator I've been limited in my acting choices because I had I had to watch what Andy did and use that as, as a template. We didn't copy it verbatim, but we we let his performance guide us. And that was actually the best thing you could do in that situation because because he was he was in this live action film and it had to be really believable. So that great attention to detail and that spine of the character's performance that Andy gave was really incredible. And I, I think that the movie the character is, and and probably the movie wouldn't have been the same if that hadn't have happened. Now, I have a funny a funny story about Gollum is they were trying to get me to animate on the first film, uh, the whatever the the Fellowship of the Ring, and I was really I was trying to get into to directing commercials at the time, so I didn't really want to go down to New Zealand and be sidetracked for a year. You know, they were saying three you're coming down for three years. I'm like, ah, no, no, so. Regardless, they 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 had me come down. They're kind of they're going to show me the studio, and I flew in with my buddy Brad, and we flew into to uh, Auckland, and we drove. We were driving down to Wellington, which is like a I think like a day trip, not the major. It's not not the biggest island in the world, and we stopped one night at this ski chateau at the base of a volcano, just randomly. Like this looks cool. So we stopped there and as we're checking out, some kids come into the front door and he's like, we're here for Lord of the Rings. So we're like, what? And we realized that they were filming up on the volcano. And so we called up the animation director, our animation supervisor, Randy Cook, and we're like, hey, uh, and Randy's like, yeah, I'm on set, come on. So 
So that we stayed an extra day and we're literally like on set as they're filming all the Mordor stuff. Mm -hmm. And as we, 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 we pulled up in the parking lot and we're getting out of our car and we heard like, like the screaming of Gollum, you know, as he's wrestling, you know, they're, they're filming that scene. And, and you, I got chills like Brad and I were like, Whoa, what's that? And Randy's like, that's Gollum. That's the guy doing Gollum. Like, Whoa, that's really cool. Like, so just from the get go, that first impression, it was iconic and just, you know, it just worked from the get go. So yeah, that was, I, I have so many stories. So <laughs> you stop me and tell me what you want me to talk about. Yeah. Uh, because you have featured Gollum itself on your uh, website uh, that I saw, you know, he's the one who's featured nothing else just to, and I would say that is truly iconic because I re remember liking the character of Gollum and you know the, with the ring, it's totally ro relatable. And the movie wouldn't have been the same without his character being in place. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. or so believable, right? Because yeah, when you watch yeah. it, even today, it holds up. You really believe that that's a real. And there's a couple shots where like it yeah. looks a little like it's animated, but yeah. for the most part, you believe you forget that that's yes. a f totally fake thing and special effects at its finest yeah but after working in all these exciting projects like uh, why did you feel the need to get into entrepreneurship good question so yeah. near the end of my my filmmaking career i was it was about well 2008 hit the the crisis the financial crisis and we didn't really feel it till about three years after and after that time, because I, I had gotten into near the end of my career, I had two totally different careers. So I would have one job where I was directing commercials and supervising uh, animation. So it was like animation director on the first Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie and and then doing like commercials like Mrs. Butterworth commercials or Monopoly commercials. And then when that gig ended, I would go to a completely different career, which was pre-visualization, uh, where we were designing the action scenes and the special effects sequences for movies. Yes. Totally different. <laughs> yeah. um, but as the work and the money in Hollywood started drying up, you, we'd be going through these, these really long spells. And there's a great documentary about that. I, I, I don't remember the name of it. Uh, but it was specifically about rhythm and hues and how all the visual effects companies have to like compete with each other and undercut. So they'll get a job, but they're actually losing money. And so it got really, really bad where there was really no work. And, and when I did have work, I was working always in crunch time. So I would be working six days a week, 12 hours a day, plus another hour and a half of traffic. And, and, and I, you know, I was in my mid thirties and I said, there's no way I can ever have a family. You know, I put my dues in. I'd done that for 15 years, you know, insane hours, except at Disney and Disney, when you're at Disney, it's like the retirement home for animators. <laughs> they got, it's like, there's so much time and so much money. It was like, I was like, guys, let's work more. Like, no, dude, you work too hard. Slow down. I'm like, all right. Um, but in the visual effects side of things, it's just like, go, 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 go. And then the minute that job's done, you're on to the next, go, 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 go. So after about three years of that, I was pretty burned out. And during that time, I'd been asked by various universities and, and uh, you know, yeah, just teaching organizations around the world. I've been asked to travel the world and mentor students to do lectures and stuff. So there was a whole uh, summer where I, I traveled around and I did lectures at like some of the top animation schools in the world. And it was really great. And all these schools were like, hey, you know, can you can you come? can you do this more? And I realized that no, I couldn't because there's just not, you know, there's not that many hours in the day. So I tried to find a solution where I could do that and, and, and teach and mentor as many people as possible without my quality of life dipping. You know, I, I for, for that, for about two years, I travel, I just travel around the, the world. It sounds exciting. Like, Oh, I traveled the globe three times, but it's really not, it's really a grind. So I, I, this was in the early days of online courses and stuff. So I had to kind of figure out what other people were doing and piece together a process to create an online brand selling my, my expertise. And lo and behold, about six months after I had figured that out, I was making way more from teaching animation virtually than I was from supervising on really big movies. So it was a no brainer that I just do this full time and I was able to leave Hollywood. And now I live in a little, fairy tale town in, yeah. in, uh, in Europe. Yeah. And so 
it was, it was just really amazing to how that process happened to me. And when that happened, so many entrepreneurs would reach out and like, what are you doing? Can you show me? And before I knew it, I became a, a business, I don't want to say business coach, but more like a marketing and branding strategist. Uh, and yeah, so that became my, uh, my new career. And I've been doing that for 10 years now. Oh, so can you tell us in brief about Visionary Planner and how can people get access to it through your website? Okay, super. Yeah. So well, if you go to MikeLMurphy.com, I've got this crazy, we just won the uh, Best yes. Website of the Year Award yes. from Webflow, which is really cool. So um, if you go there, there's links out to my other stuff like Visionary Planner. And soon I'll have my animation training. It's all it's all in a portal. I just got to make the, yes. the front end stuff and launch it. But uh, I digress. So you can either go to michaelmurphy.com or you can go to visionaryplanner.com. All roads lead to Rome. And what Visionary Planner is, it's a eight-step process to for anyone that wants to sell their information, whether they want to be a book author, they want to have a course, they want to have a retreat, they want to have a service, you know, you name it. I've sold all that stuff and I and I pieced together a process. So a lot of coaches, they'll, they'll have you focus on just a couple of the pieces and that doesn't work. You have to, it's like you're building a house. You can't just focus on the walls. You also have to think about foundation and plumbing and permits. Like there's all this crap you need in order to make a business. So I strung all that together. And now I've got a really awesome program where people come in and they just, they follow, they go step by step and they just take their passion and their expertise and they put it into the planner and it builds out their entire business without them getting overwhelmed or going, oh, should I do this instead? It's like, no, just trust the process. And we've helped hundreds of students throughout the world build six and seven figure businesses. So it's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, so Mike, before we can wrap up one last question. Uh, in today's current situation, uh, how good is a uh, career in animation and or visual arts or VFX in Hollywood? Like, is that yeah. still the burnout or like, uh, can we go for it? Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. burnout. Okay. If you're in the, if you're in a union, like if you, if you move to Los Angeles and you work for DreamWorks or Disney or what, you know, I guess Netflix now. You're right. They're going to make you be in the union. And if you're in the union, you're going to work 45 hours a week. You're going to get about hundred grand a year. And only really at the end of the movie, will you work a couple, maybe like a month of crunch time, like, because the union really protects you. But if you're in any other situation, then you're most likely, especially in visual effects, you're most likely going to be working insane hours. Now that said, when I was in my twenties, I loved it. Not a problem. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a young person's game in the beginning. And then certain people will, will elevate up to supervisor. And again, that didn't work for me because the, the hours I had to put in. So it really comes down to your passion level. You know, after, after 15 years of doing it, I felt like I'd done everything. I'd worked on some really big projects. So it was like, I, I felt good. You know, I felt like I can close the door and go explore something else. So I think if you're young and you're really passionate about it, then you got to put your dues in, you know, go for it, have fun. But know when you hit like mid thirties and you want to start having a family, uh, just plan for that in advance. And had I, had I really started my career thinking about that, I probably would have navigated my career a completely different way, but hindsight's 2020. So that's one of the things I teach my animation students is really like plan your career from the get go and don't just be like, Hey, I'm just doing stuff randomly. So I'd say that a career in animation and visual effects in particular is, you know, if we talk about COVID times, it's great because you can work remotely, right? If you want to be on a live action set, then you've actually got to go and, cool. a, you know, and you have to travel for a location. Everybody does location shooting now. So I think, I think animation and, and uh, visual effects is a lot easier to break into because uh, there's, there's so much production happening these days. And yeah, so I, I think it's still a very good career to, to jump into. Right. So thank you so much, Mike, for being on my show, Director Talks, this evening. And uh, wish you all the best for your future endeavors and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.